Welcome to Kiss the Reviews. I'm Armando, that's Corey, and today we're doing 1986's Less Than Zero. Before we get started, if you want to reach out to me or Corey on Twitter, you can reach out to me at Junior D's, you can reach out to Corey at Idle Poncho, and let's get into the cast and crew of 1986's Less Than Zero. This film stars Andrew McCarthy as Clay, Jamie Gertz as Blair, Robert Downey Jr. as Julian, and James Spader as Rip. The acting done by Robert Downey Jr. here just obliterates everyone else. Yeah, and I told you bef like before we started recording, I was like, you know, the, the acting in this was really good. But compared to Robert Downey Jr. throughout this movie, he just everybody else just kind of pales in comparison because he does such a great job in this. Yeah, this is this movie is a great example of why he was not in more John Hughes films because yes. he would have out outacted everyone. Exactly, He's so good in this movie, dude. Absolutely, absolutely, so and this is the one thing that kept striking me, and I'm not going to get into it because he doesn't like to discuss it, so. I'm not going to fucking break the guy's balls over it, but this movie is a great example of how powerful fucking drugs really are because he acted in this movie, went through this whole fucking character arc that we're going to cover, which is disgusting, and still got addicted to shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this was, you know, 86 was the, I mean, the height, I want to say, of his drug use. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, right in, in that, like, it was, like, right in the sweet spot when mm -hmm. he did this film. Um, which, to your point, is that's how powerful it is. Um, but Which is even more impressive that he kicked the fucking habit and is doing as well as he is. Oh, no shit. I mean, the we've talked about, you know, the same guy from, you know, back to school and what the, this motherfucker is Iron Man now. Like... Right. You know, he's done so many good things over his career and, you know, post addiction, if you want to call it that, that his his career took a dip and then he fucking like rose from the ashes and is one of my favorite actors of all time. now. Oh, yeah. Like if he's in something, I'm probably going to watch it, even if it's not that great. I'll still yeah. check it out because I know he's going to be good. Absolutely. This film starts at a high school graduation. You have Clay, Blair, and Julian, who are best friends. Clay and Blair are dating. And Clay and Blair are supposed to be going off to college, and Julian is starting a, a record label out yeah, of high school. Yeah, the cash because he graduated high school. Yes. Now, look, I'm as spoiled as they come, but this is next-level shit. Yes. Like, ne like, here's the money to start a record label, son, because you graduated high school, and I didn't think you would actually do this. My parents said the same thing to me and gave me a handshake. So Here's a, here's a pen set, son. That's, <laughs> that's what you got. Like I said, Blair was supposed to be headed to college, but we see in some flashback scenes that she wanted to pursue modeling instead of going with Clay to college. We also see here that she stayed back. Clay goes off to New Hampshire, wherever he goes to college. She cheats on Clay with, with Julian here. FYI, Karate Kid, this is how you do flashbacks. It's a quick... I was caught up on what had happened in the past six months within, I don't know, 45 seconds of flashbacks. Like, that's how you do that. Yeah, but man, I'm going to be honest with you. If this were written by me, it would, the movie would literally fade to black when he threw the fucking flowers on them in the black and white flashback. Movie's over. Blair calls me. Hey, I'm worried about Julian. Fuck you both. Yes. How about that? Yep. Yeah. I hope you're um, both sharing needles, you fucking sh shitheads. I'm we, done. We've, we've made point. it, we've made it painfully obvious we're not great friends, especially if you screw me over like, like literally like this. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I'm I'm out too. Like you can come. I might be coming home to see my uh, non seasoned chicken family, you know, for Christmas. But you bitches are the last people I'm going to be hanging out with, or seeing, or helping, or anything. But yeah, man, I'm gonna. When I graduated high school, I moved back to Ohio. So I had a girlfriend that I left, had friends that I left. Literally the same shit happened to me. Do you know how many of those people, like even the ones that associated with the guy that fucked my girlfriend, do you know how many of them I've talked to since then? Zero. Yep. None. And I never will. And if I ever see them, they're fucking dead. Period. All right, Sato. This You're is, dead to me. This is astounding. <laughs> To me, that he even entertains the idea of going back. Oh, absolutely. So Clay does go back after getting the call from Blair. She wants him back home, help Julian, yada, yada. Clay goes to a party like 10 minutes after he's home and sees, you know, all his old, old high school friends, old high school friends, six months after graduation. He sees all his old, old high school friends doing what they do when he, you know, what they were doing when he left which is basically doing coke and getting into some hijinks. And if you want to know why the AIDS epidemic went fucking bananas in the 80s, this is a great scene because everybody's doing all their drugs and sharing all their shit, but Clay's walking through this party, this chick he hasn't seen for six months that he just knows, grabs him and full-on makes out with him. First off, that's the best party in the world. I ha I'm so mad at my parents for being poor now. Because yes. I should have grown up in Beverly Hills where just randos grabbed you and fucking made out with you. But second, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, That's I... That's disgusting. Uh, like, I'm not sharing a joint with half of the people in that fucking room. No, you're going to get you're gonna get that, that herpy lip if, if you, if you <laughs> share the joint. Say, your, your name's going to be Cole Sore Clay when they're uh, <laughs> about three months from then. Blair here tells Clay that Julian's been spiraling out of control. He needs someone to talk to him, get him out of trouble. She doesn't really specify what kind of trouble he's in, but you kind of get a, a decent idea um, just based on Julian's character. But Julian's life has gone downhill after his record company fell apart, basically, and he's become... He's become a drug addict. He's been a drug addict. It's just getting out of control at this point. We're going to stop here and throw a PSA in because this okay. is very important, I think. Uh, hi, parents. Uncle Corey here. If your kid graduates high school, don't give them a record label. They just graduated high school. Okay? That's insane. That is a recipe for disaster, especially when your kid at his high school graduation is carrying around bottles of champagne and fucking double fisting like he's at the fucking titty bar. No! Do not give that person money. I don't care if that's your son, your daughter, you believe in them, it does not matter. They only graduated high school. That don't mean shit. Yes. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Tone Deaf Records is now a reality. Now, if you guys would just quit college, we could, we could go into business together. He's also been cut off by his dad here. Um, yes. And it's basically his whole family for stealing, to support his habit, habit. And he's basically homeless at this point. He's also being chased by his dealer, a former classmate of theirs named Rip, played by James Spader, because he owes him 50 grand that he borrowed to buy a nightclub. So. Let's take another break, and here's my first don't do that. Hi, everybody. If you're a successful drug dealer, and you have a lot of money, and you went to high school, or you're friends with a person, first of all, you're not friends anymore. You, you should know that. A, don't give them money when their dad just gave them a shitload of money to start a record label, and it failed within six months. And he tried everything to save it. It's six months later. He didn't try everything. So let's start there. On the other side, um, if you like to dabble in a bit of the, the, the drug, 
don't uh, don't go into Hawk for more and borrow 50 grand because the cool friend that used to be my classmate, drug dealer, gave you 50 grand. Um, that never ends well. Just don't do that. Any of that. No, I don't. I don't know what he really thought the end game was. And I think this is, again, we're running into the definition of white privilege here because you just assumed you could get money and make something work that you have no experience in whatsoever. I'm going to be a record producer today. Now I'm opening a club. Restart your fucking late. Like pick a fucking lane, dude. It's time. Yes. Especially when you're borrowing money from a drug dealer. Yes. As Armando said, that never goes well. It is no. going to end up, whether your club opens up successfully or not, you're now partners with a drug dealer. Yes. And they set the terms because he's not a bank, he's a drug dealer. <laughs> it looks like you could use a little Christmas chair. Julian, yeah. he's one of the most frustrating characters because he also can't seem to stop rubbing Andrew McCartney's nose and shit over the fact that he fucked Blair. Yes. Like, I mean, constantly is bringing it up. Like, do you just want me to beat the shit out of you? Is that yeah. the end game here? Because I could, we could just skip a, 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 past all the bullshit and just do it. After, like, after this whole like party scene, though, the whole beginning of this is just you have more parties, more drugs. You know, Clay instead of leaving like he wants to, ends up going to a party where Blair is and goes home with her. They sleep together. And then enter Billy, the weird, creepy, rips, fucking little, I'm gonna fuck people up guy. Like, I guess technically, yeah, he's muscle. But yeah. let me tell you, Billy, because you have a goatee and a mullet, ain't nobody scared of you, bud. Dude, With and the I, least intimidating muscle I have literally ever seen. Billy, in, okay, in 1986, if you had a goatee, that equaled like you were a tough guy and you were kind of scary. Flash, I guess. flash forward to 2021. Everybody's got a goatee, and goatees aren't scary. Just throwing that out there. I used to have a goatee. I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag. So, oh, dude, same. I had a goatee. You know what I look like? A fucking pedophile. <laughs> Introducing pedophile beards. Pedophile beards give you that creepy sex face that women simply can't resist. He, like, wanders his way in. He's looking for Julian here. He gives some weak-ass threats and then leaves. Like, he comes in and he's like, hey, I was looking for Julian. They're both naked. They're, you know, he basically saw their vinegar strokes. And he's like, where's Julian? <laughs> and they're like, I don't know where he is. He's obviously not here. We're naked. And he's like, you're Blair. I don't know you. I'm out. And then turns and leaves. I was like, was that supposed to be like, it was like the, the thinnest veiled threat I've ever heard in my life. If it was supposed to be a threat. Yeah. And this is why I am a big proponent of keeping some form of weaponry next to your bed. <laughs> because Billy just acts like, ah, Julian, now here, cool deuces and walks the fuck out. You just came into my house uninvited. Yes. Somebody about to go night night. I gotta yes. put you to sleep, cuz, cuz, no, we're not doing that shit. Absolutely. Fuck you with pseudo intimidation, especially the way you're looking at fucking Blair and like, you're Blair. I don't know you. Man, my lady's naked next to me. A guy walks in that I don't know and has that kind of pseudo threatening thing looking for you. Yeah. <sighs> He's dying, and then you and I are having a very frank conversation about boundaries. After this, they go looking for Julian. They find him sleeping on a rock by the ocean, and Clay tries to talk to him, but Julian, this is one of the, the scenes where Julian's pushing him away by saying he's going to try to bang Blair again, and he, he gets, you know, obviously really confrontational here. There's a lot of things that you get out of context, and it's just like, dude, People are trying to help and you're pushing them away. And I get that that's part of drug addiction, like in real life. But in the movie, it just, it makes it, it's just very skin deep. It felt skin deep to me and it didn't get 
more involved than that. If well, that yeah, makes like sense. You have to, no, it totally does because you have to understand that that's part of that behavior, uh, yeah. uh, drug addiction, like you said. And it's also the part of spoiled ass fucking white kids. And I'm like, not even making a joke. That's just when they don't get their way and things keep failing around them, yeah. they fucking implode because yeah. they're not used to not having just everything turn up roses for them. Well, so, and, and especially coddled rich kids. But Julian then gets the news that his uncle won't give him the money for his club because he goes to his uncle, who is also just an enabler. Like, sure, you're my oh, favorite totally. nephew. I'll give you some, I'll give you 15 grand, he asks him for. Um, and then he's like, cool, let's go do some coke in my office. Great. Um, but, you know, way to be the cool uncle, though. Julian's uncle here cut, basically cuts him off because he spoke to Julian's father and he got the whole rundown on everything. So he's cut off from his uncle now. Yes. Yeah, so and actually, I am going to stop you for a PSA right here. Hi, kids. Uncle Corey here. Uh, if you're a low-level con man who thinks you're slick and your personality's getting you to open the doors and you're getting things because of your wit and your charm, that shit runs out eventually. Yes. People are going to cut you off. You're not as slick as you think. You're not as charming as you think. And even your family knows you're bullshitting them at the time. They just don't care because they love you. Yes. Stop. It's going to run out. Get your shit together. Yeah, or you're, gonna you're... Up, or you're gonna end up doing a fucking YouTube show in your uh, kitchen talking about Dude, movies because you've got nothing nowhere else to go. Rip then tracks down Julian and asks him for his fifty thousand dollars again. He still doesn't have the cash, so Rip says that Julian will work for him now to pay off his debt, and he wants him to quote unquote meet some people. To sell drugs, you may ask. To be a salesman, Julian asks. And the answer to all of that is no. He wants him yeah. to be his prostitute. And yeah. this, this fleshes itself out here in the next few scenes. Um, but this is also what happens when you go into Hawk for that much money. Is eventually, you'll be asked to do some shit. You don't necessarily want to do, but you're going to have to. Yeah, when you've reached a junkie level, yes, nobody wants you handling money. Nobody wants you handling product. Yes. You have one purpose left, and that's it. And just uh, another FYI on, on don't do that. Don't borrow the 50 grand from a drug dealer because of this. This is a perfect example why... If you go to a bank, the bank will just say, hey, can you give us the installment payment on this 50K loan? And you go, no, I picked your name out of a hat this month and you didn't make the list, so you don't get my money. And they go, cool, we're going to sue you. The worst that you're going to do is you're going to do a stretch of jail time. At when you, most. When you owe 50 grand to a drug dealer, the, the best option is they break your legs then then comes death um or the worst option is they make you put penises in your mouth for money that goes directly to them you don't get a you don't get a cut yeah. of that Shit, no. you're yeah. going home with a stomach full of semen and regret yeah. that's yeah. it then there's a weird scene at Clay's family christmas party where he and Blair go out back and bang while his boring, bland chicken white family does boring white shit inside. And it, it, this whole scene, again, when Clay first gets home, nobody's home. We don't even right. see Clay's family until this scene. And then it's like just this weird, boring, white, rich white family that, which a, a scene later, he goes to his dad and asks him for 50 grand to help Julian out because Julian comes over like this whole scene is just really weird and this is what I mean by in the in the book this whole thing goes into way more detail yeah I was I'm gonna be honest with you I was very lost I thought this was Blair's house 
as did for the I. longest time because of the whole dad and the younger woman scene at the beginning when like she goes Blair goes to her dad and her dad's like banging some chick she went to school with and then they go to that dinner table and there's a very similar looking dad sitting at the head of the table thanking the ex-wife for letting him over and has another girl that went to high school with him. Like everybody's dad in this movie is fucking somebody that went to high school with Blair and Clay. It's yes. cra- It was so weird. I'm like, well, are they at Blair's house? And then yeah. Clay's talking about asking his dad for money. And I'm like, why is his dad at Blair's house? I was very confused as to what I was happening. I was confused and I didn't really know what was really going on. There was a couple of scene like a couple of scenes in this where the Clay's mom is like looking at him and I'm like, "Oh, this is Clay's house." But Clay looks really uncomfortable here. So is it Blair's house? And yeah. And then he goes in and asks his dad for money and I was like, "Oh, okay, they're at Clay's house." Because he starts talking about, "Oh, go go put this jewelry away cuz, you know, mom will catch you and she'll be really mad and i was like okay this is clay's house but then julian sneaks up and talks to the little girl who was nowhere to be seen before this did they just lock this poor girl in her room i never saw her at the dinner table they were at the dinner table there's one quick shot of them at the dinner table so they are there okay i thought Um, we had a flowers in the attic situation (laughs) i felt really bad for this little girl after this whole weird family scene, you cut back to Julian at the motel with Billy. And God. Billy's on the phone. Julian dips out after Billy asks if he enjoyed the party. He immediately runs to Clay's house. And he's ripped out of his mind. Clay sees Julian. He goes out to talk to him. Julian tells Clay that he needs the 50 grand to pay off Rip. Clay goes to his dad to ask for the money. As he does that, Julian goes into Clay's house, steals his mother's jewelry, has the weird conversation with, like, I don't know, his sister or his niece, and then he bounces. And then now start the hunt for Julian by Blair and Clay again. This is when Andrew McCartney starts to grow, like, the biggest balls in the world. (laughs) Yes. The way he's talking to these people that are going to fuck him up and dead him just as quick as they're going to dead Julian, like... I, I'm going to go ahead here and and do another don't do that. Hi, everybody. Here's here's a quick bit of advice, okay? if it's, it's commendable if you try to help friends in need. They have, you know, drug problems or a gambling problem or whatever the case may be. I commend you um, for, for trying to help your friends out. However, don't ever... Talk to their drug dealer, their bookie, whoever they're, they owe money to, or just get a little bit of background. If you know the person deals cocaine, um, you might not want to talk to them like you're still old friends from high school and I'm going to kick your ass in the schoolyard by the baseball fields, okay? Because this shit got real. What are you doing to him, Rip? Me? I'm not... Yeah, what's going on? Clay! Why don't you ask Julian? Because I bet he Let's knows get out of here, okay? I actually give Rip credit here. Like, he's being a dick, of course. Yeah. Because he's just fed up with Julian here. He's over it. But at the same time, he's trying to tell Andrew McCartney, like, you don't know what the fuck is going on here. Yeah. Because this isn't your business. This isn't your fucking world. And I've tried telling you numerous times. I'm telling you as your friend, cut fucking bait. This guy is done. And you're going to sink with him. Yep. That is the best advice you should ever get from a drug dealer who's trying to kill your bet. Like, he's trying to get you out of that. He's trying to get Blair out of yep. that. Stay yep. away from these motherfuckers, especially considering Andrew McCartney has made it very clear that he's not going to be buying any product from Rip. Yes. Whatsoever. So it's not like, uh, I need to keep you on the line. Because I got a new customer. No, he's just trying to be cool and like, dude, this guy is going to fucking drown you too. Yes. Get out of the water. After Blair and Clay leave, they get into this like coke fueled argument where Clay tells Blair that he's done with all the bullshit and he's leaving as soon as he can. In In all honesty here, Blair needs to shit or get off the pot. Yes. 
because she's trying to play both sides here, and I don't, like not in a shitty way, not in a sly way. Like she's really trying to. She cares about both of these guys. Yeah, and she really feels maybe that she's stuck in the middle. But at the same time, sister, it's time to pick a side. Like you can't yell at Andrew McCartney because he doesn't want to help Julian the same way you do. If you remember, that guy stuck his penis in you while we were still dating. <laughs> Yes. I am not obligated to do shit for either of you. Yeah. The fact that I'm here should have me fucking uh, uh, nominated for sainthood. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's no, just absurd that's... the way she keeps going off about him, about his lack of interest in clay. It's like, I know you're on a lot of drugs, but fucking rewind to six months ago, you loopy bitch. They, when they go back to Claire's loft, they actually find Julian passed out on the stairs. He's all oh, fucked up. Stairs. They take him up to the loft where we see a montage of them taking care of him throughout the night. And yes. this is where Clay goes to Rip to ask him to leave Julian alone. And he then threatens Rip because that's a that's a cool thing to do. And then Julian then goes home to see his father and asks to stay at home for just the night while he kind of gets his shit together. His father at first refuses and then asks him to stay clean for a week and he'll help him out. Yeah, and, and I was actually, I like I liked this scene too because I understand the hard-ass father in these movies and they usually stick to their guns. Yeah. So at the end of the movie, you're like, God damn it, that dad, if he just would have blah, blah, blah. Like this dad actually tried. Yeah. Like he sees that it's basically rock bottom here. Yeah. I mean, Julian probably still smells like vomit. So it's like I I like that he just was finally like a, a real father because I don't know very many fathers be like, nah, fuck you. Yeah. No, neither do I. And I, I was going to say I really liked this scene a lot because of that fact, because it was, yes. no, how many times have I tried to help you? I sent you to rehab. You lied your way through this. You lied your way through that. You stole. You did this, that, and the and I'm done. And again. Because he does a really great acting job here. Robert Downey Jr. convinces his father, like, no, like, this is for real now. I'm done. And you get that turnaround, like, yeah, you're my son. I love you. Like, the whole scene was just really good scene. Yes. Clay then goes after this to Blair's apartment to find her sifting through her shit as her apartment was destroyed by Rip. And they go on another trek here to find Julian in Palm Springs where he goes to find Rip and try to talk his way out of just letting Rip know that he's quitting, doing drugs, he's not working for him, and he will pay him off, but he doesn't have the money right now. I'm going to stop this here because I'm going to go wondering. to another don't do that. If you're in this situation, and if, in, in Julian's case, if you have 50 grand, you could show up and go, here's your 50 grand. I'm done. I'm out. I don't owe you nothing. You don't owe me nothing. And we're square. Peace out. Rip then goes, thanks for my money. You can leave and we won't touch you. When you show up without money, that's when things get a little sticky. No pun intended. Or maybe. Maybe there is a pun intended. But... You got to show up with the money or don't show up until you got it. Yeah. Again, I, I think we cannot stress this enough. Um, drug dealers aren't banks. They don't yes. adhere to laws and codes and all that shit. They got yes. their own shit. They change it on a fucking whim. Yes. To suit their needs. Yep. So quit fucking around. This isn't just some man to man conversation. We're going to sit down and we'll hash this out. No. End of the night. You have a pipe and a dick in your mouth, just not at the same time. Yes. Clay then finds uh, Julian here at the suite that Rip has rented out. He saves Julian, takes him down to the car. They go get Blair, and they decide that they're going to just drive away, let him sober up, and they'll straighten this stuff out tomorrow. Yeah, when and they... I'm going to drop a quick PSA if I can. Hi, kids, I guess. Uncle Corey here. I don't really want to be your uncle either. If you're the kind of person that buys a prostitute, whether it's male or female, 
I know that they're on drugs and it's probably not a willing situation. So kind of don't be a skeezy fuckback and stop buying hoes. Yes. That's, a, that's, that's an easy way to get out of this problem. Just that's stop fair. buying people for money. That'd yes. be nice. When Clay and Julian go pick up Blair, because they Clay drops her off at some party, like, hey, stay here in case he comes here. They get attacked by Rip and Billy, and there's a big scuffle here. They get into a huge fight. They finally get away and take off in Clay's car. And now, can I offer a rewrite here? Sure. Because this, as far as a fight goes, was very anticlimactic. Yes. When Clay picked up the gun that Julian dropped on the stairs when he was all fucked up before he started to clean up, I thought that was going to be some fun foreshadowing. Let's say during this fight. But it never came up again. Yeah. Let me tell you, I, I don't condone what I'm about to say, but if you find yourself in this situation... If you have a gun and you're fighting drug dealers and their muscle, it's probably a best the best idea to use the fucking gun. You don't have to fire it. But no, use it. I've, if you have a better weapon than your fists, use it. I found with guns, um, you don't necessarily have to fire it. I found waving it around puts people at bay for at least a few seconds while you make your getaway. And as they get away, they're driving through the desert. Blair's asleep. Julian falls asleep. And Clay is driving. And the next morning, as Julian passes out on Clay's shoulders, he realized that Julian's dead. And they cut to Julian's funeral here. And afterwards, Clay and Blair sitting on a bench are reminiscing about him when they were younger clay tells blair here that he's going back to college the next day and he wants her to go with him and she agrees and the film ends here with the picture they took at graduation at the beginning of the film end of movie one question teach did they have to they didn't have cell phones this is in the 80s cell phones did exist around this time okay but we never saw that music yeah, like the the giant Zach yeah, Morris yeah, yeah. phones and like I think the car phones that were like attached to the engine or whatever. <laughs> like they had okay. those. But they weren't as they aren't as prevalent as they are now and no. these guys we never saw that they had one. Yes. Did you have to drive all the way back from the desert with your drug addict friend's dead body in the back seat? Well, so a couple of things to answer your question. One, yes. Two <laughs> That Corvette was a two-seater. So your your weekend at burning it all the way back to civilization to so yeah, he's sitting between you two. You look pale. I had questions galore. <laughs> I'm sure you did, because you're a dark fuck. I'm telling you right now, bro, <laughs> if you die on my shoulder in a desert. You're being buried in that desert. <laughs> I'll tell people where you are. I ain't trying to missing person you. None of that shit. I'm just, nah, bro. We ain't uh, doing that shit. No, we, I hear this you. This is yeah. a movie. We aren't weekend at Bernie's. I'm not going to be like, hey, yeah. guys, how are you? With the string on my arm, too. Nope. <clears throat> yeah. You're getting buried right there. And I would no. expect 100% you do that to me. As far as I'm concerned, throw it in the trash. It's just my body. Um, I'm assuming Clay's car has a trunk. I'll just, I'll go with that mode of transportation versus burying my friend from high school in the desert, but whatever to each his own, you do what you want to do. I'm not, I'm not here to judge. So fair enough, but overall, I really like this movie. Um, the film is an obvious departure from the book. Uh, they took a ton of liberties on this movie from the book to to the film. And yes. uh, Brett Easton Ellis, who wrote the book, I actually read that he said he refused to see the movie and that there was no connection with the book and the movie outside of the title, the characters, and the location. <laughs> so Oops. I don't... 
I don't know if he's changed his mind since then, but um, just from, because I remember, I didn't own this book. I borrowed this book from somebody, and I'd read this book one time through, and I'd never touched it since. But from what I remember, yeah, the book was, again, not to be that guy, the book was so great because it went into so much detail. Oh, yeah. Yeah, about, 100%. About everything. But at the end of the day, dude, this was shot well. I liked the director's use of lighting and color mm-hmm. in this. Like, I thought that was that was incredible. Um the only issue that I took with this movie is that I said it before. It felt, it felt like it felt very Saint Elmo's fire. Like yeah. there, there was yeah. more. There was more things to get into and more depth to go. And I would have made this a two-hour movie, maybe two o five instead of an hour and a half, and gone into more detail. I think that would have that would have been a hell of a lot better. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to, pal? Don't get me wrong. St. Elmo's Fire is was trash compared to this movie. Um, oh, totally. It just gave me that that feel, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. Um, I like the movie. I think there are far better drug addiction movies out there. Like, I think Requiem for a Dream is fucking amazing. Yes. Uh, as far as drug addiction movies are going. Uh, that said, though... This is fantastically 80s. This is absolutely rich people 80s all the way. Everybody's style, the dancing, everything was fantastic uh, in that regard. The drug addiction still skeeved me out. Like that is one of those things in movies like that just always. I would rather watch a thousand slasher movies than watch people just like going through yeah. That kind of hardcore addiction. Like, that just uh, grosses me out. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, so I thought they did a really good job with that. Um, again, Robert Downey Jr. fucking killed it. Absolutely yeah. killed it. And I, I really felt for him. Especially knowing now, like, if you're not around our age or grew up in the 80s and 90s, like, back then, drug addiction wasn't looked at the same way it is now. It was very much, you're a piece of shit. You chose to do this. This is all on you. You're disgusting. You, you, you. And they hinted at that a little bit. But they really didn't get into that part of it, which I thought was nice. That made it seem like it was a little bit more realistic. Like, not everybody's trying to just take a giant dump on it. Yes, exactly. Um, so I thought that made it a little bit, uh, that still keeps it relevant today because you're not just listening to a bunch of uneducated jackasses fucking trying to proselytize, uh, uh, on drug addiction. So I appreciated that fact. I thought overall it was a really, it's a good movie. I don't know if I would ever be like, oh great, Lesson Zero's on, I'm going to watch it. It's a good movie if we were going to watch it again. Uh, you know, do a review of this again, two, three years later, whatever, fine. But other than yeah. that, I'm good. Yeah, I, it's it's not one of these movies. I mean, I don't really go out and, and re- regardless of, of what the movie is, you know, drug addiction type. I'm not like, oh, yeah, can I watch that again? I'll watch it back to back. I'm not excited to to go that route. But this is a good movie. And one other thing, the soundtrack was really good and it wasn't just like oh 80s oh van halen's in this and whatever there was got ll cool j was mm. was in this um soundtrack oh, yeah. they wise even had the run dmc christmas song yeah that i was gonna say the uh, christmas and house queens they had public enemy as well yep. like i thought the the soundtrack was well-rounded for that time like, oh yeah it the, was, uh, the soundtrack covered a lot more of that uh, in-depth stuff than I think the character arcs did that yeah, you were exactly. looking for. Exactly, exactly. But that's all I got for this, man. Uh, do you have anything else? Uh, I don't. Okay. Well, for Corey, I'm Armando. This is Kiss the Reviews, and this was 1986's Less Than Zero.